Good evening. That's better. Um, it's, it's an extremely inefficient little touch screen right here. I just, I have to let you know that. Um, welcome. We are so glad you're here under threat of rain and storm. You are the few and the proud, and we are glad you're here. Or the many and the proud. I don't know why I said few. Um, welcome tonight to our event, When They Came Home, Soldiers and American Society from the Revolution to the War on Terror. Um, I thank you for being here. I thank you especially on behalf of our director, Jeffrey Engel. He was not able to be here, although he desires to be here. He is off doing what he does, which is receiving some award for all of his amazing research from the university and meeting with the Board of Trustees, uh, so we wish him well there. Um, I also want to thank um, Dedman College for their continued support of us and the work we do here. Um, and I want to thank um, Adam Kane, who's here with us from the University of Oklahoma Press, and especially uh, General Pat Mordente, uh, the director of the George W. Bush Presidential Library, for their support for this event tonight. It's great to come together in common cause with them, um, as well as some of our other partners over this past year, the Departments of History and Religious Studies, the Clement Center for Southwest Studies, the World Affairs Council, the Tower Center, and many others. Uh, hopefully, you picked up on your way in. If you did not, please pick up on your way out. Um, our list of events that we've got for next year. These will be up on the website pretty soon as well, uh, but we will have some old partners and hopefully some new. Um, you should see some really great themes running through this. I won't mention them all to you, but we have a couple of events that focus on the power of first ladies and shaping presidencies and their legacies, uh, the role of religion in modern America through uh, World War II missionary spies and the oil industry, we're doing a series with the History Department through their Stanton Sharp Lecture Series on China and the United States and what it means to be Asian American in this country throughout our history. And one we're particularly excited about, and we hope you will mark down, is in October, we'll be hosting, along with the Tower Center, the last card in the deck inside George W. Bush's decision to surge in Iraq. This is a culmination of a several years long project that we've been leading here at the CPH where we filmed something like 30 interviews with members of the Bush administration from the White House, State Department, Defense Department, and beyond, all focused on the question, how did President Bush make this major military decision to surge troops and announce that decision in 2007? And so that event will be a full day-long event um, with panels of participants and also scholars, and that evening we'll have a keynote address by Steve Hadley, the former National Security Advisor, and we'll be releasing that day um, a book from Cornell Press and also a website featuring all of this information. So and we're really excited about that. I want, since this is the last event of our year, to kind of, if you will, indulge me and reflect just a little bit on the work we are privileged to get to do here at the center. I want to tell you a little bit about our postdoctoral program. Uh, you see our postdoctoral fellows all the time. Often in here, uh, they might be carrying microphones. Um, but they're doing so much more with us. Our postdoctoral program is designed to welcome people who have finished their PhDs at universities all over the country, and in fact, all over the world. And they come here for two years to research and write and participate in the life of our center. We'll welcome three new postdocs this coming fall, coming from Temple University, George Mason University, and across the far reaches of Lake Highlands from UT Dallas. Um, <laughs> Now, the good news is that we're receiving those new ones. The, I shouldn't say bad news. The other side of that good news is that a couple of our postdocs are or have left us, but for good reason, and that's because they're going on to great jobs. Um, Blake Earle is heading down to Texas A&M Galveston, and Lindsey Travinsky. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was him leading the clap. Um, and Lindsey Travinsky, who um, helped organize, lead organizing tonight, is at the White House Historical Association. Yeah, that's great. And we've, in a very difficult and sometimes dismal job market, we are so thrilled that all of our postdocs have gone on to excellent employment at places like Texas State, Florida State, the papers of Andrew Jackson, the University of Toronto, and beyond. Um, one of the things that we encourage our postdocs to do um, while they're here, and usually their main uh, task is working on their book manuscripts. And you may have seen some of this in the slides beforehand, but um, they're working on a book as they're here with hopes of publishing it. And we've had great success with our postdocs with that as well. 
Um, many of them, most of them, have already secured contracts with major university presses at Oxford, Cornell, Princeton, Harvard. And in fact, to bring our next year's events and our postdocs together, I'm holding in my hand the evidence in December We'll be hosting former CPH postdoc Tim Sale, who's now at the University of Toronto, to come and speak about his new book, Enduring Alliance, A History of NATO and the Post-War Global Order. And I will remind everyone, we brought Tim here before the 2016 election when NATO was not such a difficult topic, apparently, but we knew, we knew we are prophets. Um, so this is all exciting, and I haven't even gotten to mention our D-Day trip which um, Jeff leads and which I am so grateful to be able to go on this year, thanks to your support, particularly for the students' scholarships. Um, when you give, you help support that. Uh, by your presence here with us, you're spreading the word and that financial support, our center is growing, and we really thank you for being here. Now, I um, said it was prophetic um, regarding NATO, um, and I will give you another prediction. You're going to really enjoy this evening. Uh, the big question for tonight is, is relatively straightforward. After serving in the armed services during wartime, what happens when soldiers come home? How do they influence government? How do they integrate into society? How do they shape society? And tonight, our guests will tackle those questions about American soldiers from the American Revolution all the way to the present day in the War on Terror. So allow me just to give you some very short introductions of each of our guests. And then what will happen is each of them in turn will uh, take a moment to share from their own research, and afterwards we'll open it up to discussion amongst them and with you. So first, Lindsay Travinsky, who I just mentioned to you, a former now CPH postdoc, now historian at the White House Historical Association, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization founded by Jackie Kennedy to enhance uh, an understanding of the White House and its history. Her first book, the Cabinet, George Washington, the Creation of, American, of an American Institution will be published by Harvard Press next spring. Yeah. Um, next to her, Dr. Leslie Gordon is the Charles Somersell Professor of Southern History at the University of Alabama. She has written extensively on the Civil War era, most recently in her book, A Broken Regiment, the 16th Connecticut Civil War from LSU Press. Um, next to her, Nate Packard is Assistant Professor of Military History at the Command and Staff College at the Marine Corps University. He's a member of the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve and a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. His forthcoming book is entitled The Marine Corps' Long March, Modernizing the Nation's Expeditionary Forces in the Aftermath of Vietnam, 1970-1991. Finally, we have Corey Shockey, who you may recognize. She's been with us before. She is the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, an organization which helps shape and support sound international policies in countries across the globe. She previously served in multiple posts in the U.S. government, including in the Defense and State Departments and on the NSC. She is the author most recently of Safe Passage, the transition from British to American hegemony, from Harvard Press also. And I want to mention he's not here with us. We are sadly missing the fifth uh, and co-equal contributor to this project, Chad Williams. He's the Samuel and Augusta Spector Professor of History and Africa and African American Studies at Brandeis University. He's the author of many works, especially on African American military history, including his book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in the World War I Era. You all know that the job of a historian carries many potential injuries, physical injuries. It's very demanding. Um, <laughs> Chad actually tore his MCL. Um, I would like to say it was when he was doing some vigorous writing, but he was playing basketball. Um, but he wasn't able to join us, and I know that he really wanted to, and we're sorry not to have him. So tonight, again, we'll hear short presentations from each, and then I will kind of help moderate some discussion among all of us. I appreciate you all being here, and now I will welcome to the podium our first speaker, Lindsay Travinsky. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such a treat to be back in Dallas and to be back in this room, although now in front of the microphone instead of carrying it around to you. Um, I had the privilege of contributing a chapter on the Revolutionary War. And the Revolutionary War is in some ways totally unique from the rest of the military experiences that the United States has endured, and in some ways is very similar 
And one of our challenges with this volume was trying to draw out what are the parallels between the different wars? What are things that happen again and again? And what are the things that make them unique? So for example, during the Revolutionary War, soldiers were viewed with high levels of distrust. The United States was, with the process of declaring itself independent from Great Britain, one of the key issues was a huge distrust for standing armies. And so soldiers were viewed as dangerous. And this continued after the war, such that, the, that Congress did not pass full pensions for veterans until the 1820s, far after the war had been over, the War of 1812 had been fought, and soldiers were no longer viewed as dangerous as they once had been. On the other hand, there are certain things that the Continental Army crafted a script that the Army would follow over and over again. So for example, Washington created a precedent that military authority would be subservient to civilian government. This is a key principle of the United States and one that is taught in military classes, one that is in our textbooks and is really, really important. And so as I'm drawing out some of these parallels, there are a couple of things that I noticed about the 1780s that I draw on in my chapter that when veterans were going home after the war, their influence on society, their influence on culture, and what they did in an attempt to sort of remake or help create a new nation, because I cannot state strongly enough that the 1780s were very much a time of flux. They were very much a time of organic development. What it meant to be an independent nation was not solidified yet. What it meant to be free from British control was very much a question. And who would be involved in that project who would be a citizen, who would be included, was very much up for debate. So there are three big contributions that soldiers made in the aftermath of the Revolutionary War. First, they created fraternal organizations. And this is something that I think you will see time and time again as my colleagues talk about post-war activity. The Society of the Cincinnati was created by Henry Knox in 1783. It was the first fraternal order of veterans after a war. Unlike some of the other fraternal organizations that we'll hear about, it was only officers, which meant that it was only white men. And the purpose of it was to preserve and to protect the values and the honor of soldiers that had served because they looked around and they thought maybe Americans weren't doing such a good job of protecting the values of the Revolutionary War, the virtuous little R Republicans. And it was also to help take care of the veterans and their families who had suffered really, really bad injuries or death during the war when it wasn't clear that the states and the government were going to do so. So that's the first thing, this concept of fraternal, fraternal um, organizations and brotherhood and banding together when maybe the rest of society wasn't necessarily going to do a good enough job taking care of these soldiers. The second concept was reform. Now, whether that meant reform in terms of what citizenship would mean, so would more white men be able to vote even if they didn't own property? Would African Americans who served in the war be able to be free? Or would the government need to be reformed to address the needs of a new nation and provide currency that worked, provide defense, provide some of the things that it wasn't really necessarily clear the government was going to be able to provide. And so when we see things like the Constitutional Convention, which happened in 1787, an overwhelming number of the delegates were soldiers. An overwhelming number of the people that rallied in support for the new Constitution were officers. And I make an argument that this sort of nationalism, which supported stronger federal government, went hand in hand with military service, which I think is something that we see again and again, that military service shapes what nationalism perhaps ought to be. And the last factor is participation in government. So after the passage of the new constitution, overwhelming numbers of officers served in the new government. And I say officers because 1780s society was very split. It was very hierarchical. It was very economically divided. The officer corps were, were gentlemen 
and the infantry tended to be poorer individuals. And so the officers, the gentlemen, served in, in office as well. And so the first cabinet, for example, Henry Knox had been a general of artillery, Edmund Randolph had been an aide-de-camp to General Washington, and Alexander Hamilton, of course, had famously also been an aide-de-camp and had, been, had served as an officer as well. Same thing in the Senate, same thing in the House. Overwhelming numbers of officers served in these new positions. And they really shaped what the new government was going to look like and how it was going to guide the nation going forward. So those are the big three principles that I draw on when I look at how the Army participated in the new society after the end of the war. And one of the really great privileges has been able to see what precedents were created and continued in the conflicts afterwards and how things, sometimes when we study a historical moment, we think that it, it's, a, it's a one and done. And that's really not the case. So I'm looking forward to you being able to hear some of the other parallels. Thank you again for being here. And I look forward to our discussion. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate Lindsay's invitation and, and to share with you all uh, today some of my, uh, my contribution to this uh, this soon to be published volume. <laughs> uh, so it's, in Civil War history, it may surprise you that veterans themselves have really not gotten that much attention until relatively recently, just sort of looking at the veteran experience in its own terms. So in taking on this challenge and thinking about the sort of broad contours of, of this project, what I decided to do was to take four individuals from my current book project. I'm looking at regiments that were accused of cowardice, which is a whole other discussion. And I just picked four men that I happen to have a lot of uh, information on and I thought would, would offer some interesting contrasts. And so they're, I think, in very many ways representative uh, of the Civil War experience and the veteran experience. Um, so these four men, I'll just quickly mention a little bit about them. Uh, the first is Francis Brownwell, who was a member of the 11th New York. These were Zouaves, fire Zouaves. If you know anything about Elmer Ellsworth, it's a very famous story. He was killed early in the war. Francis Brownwell, Brownwell uh, killed the assassin who uh, turned on Elmer Ellsworth in Alexandria, Virginia in uh, May of 1861. And from what I can tell, he never actually experienced combat. He ends up gaining a commission in the regular army, and he gains a Congressional Medal of Honor because of that moment. Um, but his military service lasts long. After the war ends, he's finally mustered out a couple years after, um, although he claims that he retired sometime in, in, in 1864. He goes on and... Uh, lives off that moment in Alexandria of killing again this assassin, who by the way was a civilian. And the pieces I'm putting together about him is he doesn't often or even very much talk about his own service. He always talks about Elmer Ellsworth. Um, even though he had that Congressional Medal of Honor, he ends up dying in 1894. His wife, who he seemed to have been estranged from, does file for a pension uh, as a widow. So what I'm trying to track with his experience, he's a northerner, he's a native-born white male who probably was tracking to become a clerk, you know, this kind of experience before the war happened. Everything changes for him and he becomes a celebrity. But then he's kind of forgotten ever since. So it really intrigued me to think about what the war meant to him and how it gave him this exposure publicly. Uh, and again, he never, from what I can tell, was in combat. The next... Uh, Example is Sam Houston Jr., who I, you know, Sam Houston, I'm sure you all know very much about. You may not know very much about his son, who was his eldest son, and uh, against his father's wishes, enlisted as a private. You know, Sam Houston perhaps was against the Confederacy and against secession, but his son willingly went forward and actually uh, went sort of re upped three times. He was a private, he was injured and in prison, he came home, recovered, uh, enlisted again as a private, finally took a commission, and he ends up serving out to the very end, to the bitter end, in June of 1865 when he surrendered uh, as part of Kirby Smith's force. 
And from what I can tell too, publicly, he never talks, at least when I can tell, about his own personal service. He talks about the war, the lost cause. He's a believer in that. He talks about his father. He's a defender of his father. But I found that really interesting in those two cases right there, that these two men don't talk about themselves. So just quickly, the other two, uh, Pierre Pelletier is from the 126th New York, and he's a doctor. He's a physician. He earns his medical degree from the University of Buffalo. So he's not, a, he's not a combatant in the traditional sense, but he talks actually quite a bit about the war and his own experiences, and he's very involved in the memorization of his regiment, and he gives the keynote at Gettysburg in the, in the commemoration of the, of the 126th um, monument there. And he talks about, he uses, he makes his claim in that address that only veterans can understand veterans that unless you went through it, you don't know what it was like, which is a, which is a concept and a, an idea, I think, that we can find uh, deep, deep roots. And the last person that I examined is an African-American free man from Pennsylvania, John Peck, who was drafted. He did, not, he did not willingly volunteer. He was drafted into the 8th United States Colored Troops, and he saw combat. Uh, at, first at a lusty Florida, and then later in, during the Siege of Petersburg. It, the records for him are, are uh, much less uh, uh, deep and, and, and expansive, but the pieces that I think we can pull together is he has a completely different experience than his white counterparts. And in the most basic sense, after the war, he ends up moving to Paducah, Kentucky, and he files for a disability pension, and it's denied. And he talks about in his pension, and this is oral, it's taken orally because he cannot write, he marks his name with an X, that he, was, um, he has two battle scars, one from Alusty and one from Petersburg, but he was still denied a pension because the white examiners determined that he could still work. So his civil war and his military service is, I think, much more ambivalent, and it's hard to really uh, you know, see as an affirmation compared to, the, to these other, other white men. So those are the kind of things I'm trying to, to sort out in, in my own contribution um, to this project. And I can certainly take, take more uh, questions and talk more about them. But I think overall what I'm trying to do and hoping to do is really complicate our impression, our, our assumptions about what it was like to be a Civil War soldier and what it was like in the aftermath of this war. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to start off by thanking the center and thanking Lindsay you know, for inviting me uh, to come here and, uh, and, and share with you. Uh, I have uh, two twin two-year-old daughters, uh, so this has been wonderful. I haven't changed a diaper in 48 hours at this <laughs> point, so I am really excited uh, to be here tonight. Uh, so again, my, my, my topic was Vietnam veterans after the war. And, I just want to start out by saying that it, it was quite a challenge for, for two reasons. Um, first off, you, how do you capture the experiences of roughly 3.5 million uh, individuals if, over the course of 20 years, if you start uh, with the advisory period in the 1950s and carry that through the fall of Saigon in 1975? I mean, that's a lot of people over a very long uh, period of time. So, uh, so that was a challenge. And also for me, it was, it was very personal. Uh, I'm a third generation uh, Marine. Um, and so I saw, I saw some of the dynamics play out firsthand. Um, my experience as a post 9-11 veteran and my grandfather's experiences as a World War II veteran were very different than my father's experiences as a Vietnam uh, era uh, veteran. Uh, so you know, that was something I, I had to, to, to take into account. You know, for myself and my grandfather, this was a positive experience. For my father, maybe not, not as much. Um, and then finally, as a historian who, who studies the Vietnam War, uh, many of my subjects are still alive. Uh, just by a show of hands, do I have any Vietnam <coughs> veterans in the room? Yeah, so that's, you know, that, that makes it hard. Uh, um, over the past 20 years, they've been my teachers. Uh, in some cases, they were my uh, superior officers in, in, the, in the military. Uh, they've been my colleagues, and, and most importantly, they've been uh, my friends. Uh, so it was important for me to get this as right as I could. Uh, I wanted to do, do right by them, uh, and so, uh, and so uh, you know, hopefully uh, I did. 
what I'm going to do is I'm just going to provide three general observations and then three uh, specific areas where I think Vietnam veterans had a, 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 had a significant impact. And, and in the chapter, I develop each of these themes uh, uh, in greater detail. Uh, first general observation is that uh, because Vietnam was uh, arguably our country's most unpopular war, Vietnam veterans, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, carried a stigma that <coughs> veterans of other wars haven't. Uh, a number of the veterans that I talked to would talk about World War II as being a good war. Their father's war was viewed as a good war, and then their war being viewed as a bad war, and that was something that, uh, uh, that again, that, that impacted them uh, you know, it, you know, quite a bit. Um, second observation is that there's no single experience. Um, despite the dominant uh, narrative of every Vietnam veteran being a, a hardened, you know, combat infantrymen, you know, battling, you know, the Viet Cong in the jungles. Uh, in fact, that was actually a minority uh, of your Vietnam veterans. The vast majority uh, performed uh, some type of uh, support function. Uh, and I would argue, aside from pilots and nurses, we really haven't um, examined the experiences of those other uh, Vietnam uh, veterans, or, or the vast majority of Vietnam veterans uh, who weren't combat infantrymen. Uh, and their stories remain to, to be told. Uh, and the, the final general observation is, uh, despite the stereotype of the maladjusted Vietnam uh, veteran, uh, a number of longitudinal studies actually uh, show that the vast majority of Vietnam veterans uh, reintegrated back into American society uh, relatively smoothly. Certainly there were some who had difficulties, particularly in the first five years um, uh, after their return. Uh, but I would argue that Vietnam veterans were no more, you know, had, had did not have uh, difficulties, more difficulties than did your Civil War veterans or your World War II veterans. It's just that you know, we tend to, uh, to, to think of them uh, differently um, as being particularly troubled. Um, as far as specific areas where I think uh, uh, Vietnam veterans had a, a, a significant impact, uh, they reformed the U.S. military. If you look at what the, the, what the U.S. military was in the immediate aftermath of Vietnam and then uh, the U.S. military in the Gulf War, um, that was the work of Vietnam veterans who chose to stay, uh, who chose to stay in the service, uh, and then and then reform the, the military. They they, uh, you know, they rebuilt the U.S. military. And uh, when it comes to uh, to the use of military force, uh, I would argue that Vietnam veterans were also fairly influential, uh, particularly as they reached higher levels of uh, you know, political office, um, senators, congressmen. Uh, that uh, yeah, they're also very skeptical and deliberate when it comes to using military force. Um, think of the Powell Doctrine, for example. Um, you know, you, you want to, uh, again, be very careful when you commit U.S. Uh, uh, forces overseas. Uh, and so uh, in those two areas, I think that they, uh, they, they were particularly impactful. Uh, in the political sphere, one of the interesting things that I noticed is this is the only uh, cohort of veterans uh, that served in a major war where you know, nobody uh, from their ranks you know, uh, uh, became president. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, time and again, those who avoided serving in Vietnam actually defeated uh, Vietnam veterans for, for the, the highest office. And you know, oddly enough, it, you know, in the case of uh, President Clinton and President Trump, you, you would see them then use veterans as a backdrop, but they themselves had avoided service. So again, unlike some of these other conflicts, this is one of those ones where it seems like being a veteran was maybe in some ways a black mark or was something that had to be overcome, whereas non-service uh, was, uh, uh, was in some ways you know, rewarded by the electorate. Uh, specific area number two, um, Vietnam veterans were instru instrumental in, in, in how the war was remembered in literature, film, and, uh, and in some of the, the, the historical works that have been written about it. And of particular note, they, they provided these gritty first-hand accounts of combat and think of books such as you know, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried or Carl Marlantis's Matterhorn, uh, movies like Platoon. Um, and so again, Vietnam veterans uh, made uh, quite a, a contribution in terms of the, the literature that's out there. Uh, at the same time, some of this work serves to reinforce some of those stereotypes of Vietnam uh, veterans as being, you know, again, combat infantrymen who then had a hard time reintegrating uh, you know, why does this matter? Uh, well, when it comes to pop culture, and this is something that I think Corey will touch on, one of the things that we were both surprised by, or I guess one of the things we, we saw was that 
when it comes to people's understanding of veterans, particularly today, oftentimes pop culture, pop culture is, is the primary influence. So how veterans are depicted, uh, particularly in film and on TV, it really matters because you know, for, for people today, that's oftentimes the only, uh, the only perspective that they, that they get. Um, and then uh, a final area where Vietnam veterans uh, had an influence was uh, in, in pressing for veterans' benefits. Uh, Vietnam vets were particularly active, uh, and as with the Society of Cincinnati, in the case of Vietnam veterans, you have Vietnam veterans uh, of America. Uh, interestingly enough, you have a, a much, uh, there's, there's more of an enlisted presence. Uh, this is not as elitist as some of these previous organizations. Um, Vietnam veterans of America active in forcing the, the government to recognize uh, uh, yeah, the veterans who had issues uh, with exposure to Agent Orange, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, the establishment of vet centers uh, that we still have today, uh, that you still see today, um, where veterans could go and share their experiences uh, and, and seek uh, and, and hopefully get, get some help with whatever issues they were facing. And also the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall was very much a veterans-led uh, project, you know, you know, forcing the government to remember this, uh, this, this conflict. Uh, and just a, you know, one, one final thought that, uh, that, that, that strikes me is, yeah, especially as this generation in some ways you know, passes from the scene, is yeah, I would argue that we, we probably haven't learned enough from Vietnam veterans as maybe we should have or, or, or could have. Uh, and so you know, hopefully we can do that, maybe challenge some of those stereotypes that are out there and, uh, uh, and again, learn, learn from their uh, experience. And so, It is such a pleasure to be back at the Center for Presidential History. I had the fun of looking at the experience of contemporary veterans and their reintegration into society. And uh, the experience of contemporary veterans is markedly different from the experience of the veterans of all three of the examples that we looked at, and also from the different from the experience of veterans in World War I and World War II. It's uh, different in two ways, or for two reasons. The first set of reasons is structural, that because uh, our military is good at its job and the threats we face are not nearly of the magnitude and the technology substitution effect, that we have a very small military for the size of our population. If you think about the comparison of World War II, there were 10 million American men under arms in a population of 135 million people. We now have 1.3 million uh, service women and men for a population of 330 million people. So it's about, it's less than 1% of the population. And that population is not drawn evenly from across the United States. It is a pernicious myth that our veterans are drawn, uh, that our servicemen and women are drawn from less well-educated, lower income and minority populations. None of those three things are true. One of the reasons that myth gets so much um, traction, though, is because only 16% of Americans have a family member, an extended family member, who has been in military service since 2000. So the lack of familiarity, uh, if people don't know anybody who's in military service, it's easy to believe all sorts of things at, about them being different than you. Uh, and moreover, uh, the strongest correlate for people who come into military service is people who live in the proximity of a military base. Uh, so where our military bases are tells us a lot about who comes into military service in the United States. Uh, so, so there's a distancing of contemporary veterans from the broader population in a way that that would have been unknown to veterans of World War II, for example, where every American family had the, was touched by the war in one way or another. So, uh, so the structural factors of a small force, a professional force, so they stay in service longer, typically, um, and uh, drawn disproportionately from where large bases are, and in the last 
30 years, we have consolidated our military from small bases sprinkled all around the country into large bases, partly as an economy measure and also partly because our standards for how fast we can get forces in the world have increased dramatically and that requires them being at large bases. The second uh, factor that makes the experience of contemporary veterans different from veterans of previous wars is that we're still fighting the wars of the contemporaries. That is, no ticker tip parades, no declaration of victory. They still feel, many veterans still feel quite a strong association with their counterparts who are still fighting the wars in the Middle East and in Afghanistan, and increasingly uh, fighting anti-terrorist operations around the globe. So they still pay attention to what's happening. They still have continuing connections. And that makes it more difficult for many veterans for their veteran identity to be only one part of their identity or something that is a past identity as they reintegrate into American society. What I think these distancing factors have uh, caused in the civil military relationship in the United States is a greater feeling of isolation by veterans from the rest of civilian society. And second, um, a, a shocking amount of ignorance by us civilians about both the experience uh, and even basic facts about military life. So for many veterans, the fact that they have been on repeated deployment cycles since September 11th, 2001, and that the war has almost not touched civilian society in America. It's very common to hear veterans say, for example, that we're not a country at war, we're just a military at war. Um, and that has civil military implications, and it has implications for how veterans reintegrate. Um, the most important one in my judgment is that we, because we have so little familiarity with the military experience, that you see a bifurcation of public attitudes about the military. Uh, by far the majority view is that you know, servicemen and women are Marvel comic book heroes. They leap tall buildings in a single bound. They're more virtuous than the rest of us. Uh, they're avatars for, uh, for civic engagement in a way that excuses the rest of us not doing those things. Um, and uh, the overwhelming part of the American civilian population views our military that way. About 5% of the population, um, and typically these are people who, in the surveys that we ran, and I should say parenthetically, um, I was part of a group that ran the largest set of surveys of American public attitudes about the military that have been done since 1998. So we have a whole bunch of data on how the public thinks about the military. And only about 5% of Americans have a negative view of the military, and they are people who identify as very liberal politically. So um, for many of that group, it's not so much about the military, it's a doctrinal view um, rather than a view of experience or any particular animus towards folks in the military. So even in that 5%, there, there tends not to be an active hostility to the military. And this is anomalous in most countries' experience. The fact that the United States has such an outsized affection and admiration for our military really is the result of the work that Nate was talking about, about the rebuilding of the American military after the Vietnam War. Uh, but you have these two bifurcated views of who the military are and what they do, um, and that drives a lot of attitudes. So f let me just close by giving one example of it, which is the real world effects of these views. So um, you may recall that around 2004, when the Iraq war was really tough fighting, um, and it was a major political issue in American national politics, um, journalists quite virtuously started covering the challenges of post-traumatic stress that service women and men are, 
have been experiencing. What we saw that do, uh, you can track by unemployment figures, which is that um, because public attention on PTSD created this notion that all veterans are somehow damaged and somehow dangerous, which is, of course, again, a pernicious myth about the American military, but so few people in our broad civilian population have firsthand experience of, of service men and women that you can actually see in Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers the effect of that, which is that typically employment rates for veterans are higher than employment rates for the civilian population. Right, so there are fewer unemployed veterans than there are of the age cohort in the civilian population because typically they have a set of skills, they have organization, uh, those good things. What you see in the period, in this time period from 2005 for about five years before it perks out of the system is that veterans, especially those age 18 to 34, uh, the the unemployment rate for their civilian counterparts was about 9% at that point in time. It was more than twice that for veterans because there was this public sense that they're all damaged and all potentially dangerous. And it took the continuation of a broad public campaign led by journalists to educate all of us about post-traumatic stress before people realized that wasn't true and it stopped having employment effects. The happy news, unemployment rate for veterans right now, anyone who knows what it is? 2.3%. Um, so uh, there's a happy end to this story, but uh, that's, that's a snapshot of the way that the experience for the veterans of our contemporary wars is different from the experience of most other veterans of wars. The closest comparability in my judgment is actually the experience of soldiers who fought on the frontier fought the Indian Wars um, because they are away from regular interaction, normal civic interaction. They are, uh, the, the general public pays very little attention to what they are doing unless there's a disaster. Mm -hmm. Unless they, they have a mistake or a massacre, you don't hear about the successes, you only hear about the failures. And um, they, they are sporadically connected back to the rest of society in a way that reminds them how different they are from the society they are protecting. Thank you. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do here is have a discussion and before, um, I think we have at least one microphone that when it, we have two microphones that when you have a question, please wait and those will get passed to you so we can all hear you. But before I open it up to the audience, I know that being on kind of a group panel like this, often after you hear your colleagues speak, you're thinking, oh, I forgot to say that, or, or that correlates with this that I wanted to say. And so before I open it up to you all, I wanted to give the four of you a chance. And by the way, you need to just click your mics on. There's a little, little button on the top. So l let me ask the four of you, as you're listening to one another and you've worked with each other over the last day, but you only got a few minutes to speak, what's something about the experience of your veterans, if I can call them that, that um, you want to highlight or you feel like tracks or doesn't track with what one of your colleagues was saying? I might open it up to the four of you to discuss that first. I'll just start off by saying one of the things that Corey and I were talking about was this idea of, uh, what do we got, you know, post-traumatic strengthening, an idea that uh, Secretary Mattis had thrown out there. If you look at some of the, the polls that were done on Vietnam veterans, and when they were asked, you know, you know overall looking back, you know, was this a positive or a negative experience, the majority said that it had actually benefited them uh, as opposed to, to, to been a negative experience. And, and I think, again, this idea of veterans as damaged or having suffered, uh, the majority of veterans would arguably say that, you know, that it was a positive experience for what it was worth. Um, and I know you. Yeah, maybe if you, you can pop those off the stands oh, if you want. So uh, I found a 
resonance between something in Lindsay's chapter about the Revolutionary War veterans and contemporary veterans. And it, the, the creation of the Society of the Cincinnati, for example, the notion on the part of the military officer corps in that case that they are uniquely virtuous and uniquely the guardians of, of civic um, values. I do hear a resonance of that in contemporary veterans. And in both cases, I think it's actually an unhealthy development in civil military relations. I want to piggyback off of that and say that I think one other resonance is the separation of the military from the rest of society. So the Continental Army was really quite small, and um, it was a constant problem. Washington was always begging for more men, but it was really quite small. And they were always stationed away from society because there was a concern that they would steal things, they would be not very nice to their daughters, they would um, take their cows, they were dirty, they spread disease, they didn't like to use their latrines. Um, so there was this notion that they were bad and dangerous and so they were separate. And so there was very little interaction on a day-to-day -day between the civilians and between the army, which led a lot of civilians to think that they were sitting around getting paid and getting a free place to live and food and not really doing a whole lot, especially towards the end of the war. And that wasn't the case. They weren't getting paid. And the housing was really pretty crappy. And um, so I think that separation is something that we is not necessarily the case with the Civil War or with World War II, where you have such intense numbers of the population participating in a conflict. Um, and so you see some, I think, some differences in attitudes in that way. Yeah, I just want to add uh, what struck me in the conversations we had earlier today and, and, and a little bit we talked about tonight is in, in Civil War history, we have the opposite in the sense that, and I've been one of the scholars trying to push back against this, there is, I, I still think, and maybe some of you, I don't know, maybe you feel differently, there's been a public conception that Civil War soldiers across the board were sort of the same, that they fought for what they so-called believed in, they were brave, you know, you can look at the, the monuments and this whole controversy we're going through right now with Confederate monuments, but Union monuments are the same. You know, if you re read the rhetoric, the writing on these monuments, is that everybody was brave. And what's driven all my work, really from the start, is, is these are human beings. You know, men fail, they run away. Um, there were real heroes. And why we can't under, you know, accept that as Civil War historians, I'm not really sure we've talked about this earlier. Um, the, we can, you know, to complicate the picture and appreciate that like in any war, veterans are gonna run the gambit. And, and I will tell you, there's been real pushback um, on the part of some historians in doing this, this notion that somehow it makes them victims, it's, it's too dark. And I, I find that really um, remarkable when you're looking at this kind of topic. So one of the things that I appreciate so much in our conversations is, you know, in my, I don't know if you all appreciate this, but often historians, we get into our little niches and we don't really talk to each other, right? We don't talk across the board to folks that work on, you know, modern wars or even backwards into the revolution. So this has been really valuable for me to remind me that, you know, we, we, get, uh, we get in a vacuum in our own work. Why don't I open it up if you've got questions. I've got one right up here in the front. So correct me if my uh, perception's wrong, but my perception of the Vietnam War is individuals went into their unit by themselves, stayed a period of time, and then came out by themselves, whereas in most other wars, units went and came back as groups. What was the rationale behind that? Was it a good idea, a bad idea? What's the impact of it? So uh, from a personnel management standpoint, and I'll speak just to the Marine Corps, from a personnel management standpoint, it is much easier for personnel managers to do individual rotations rather than unit rotations, particularly in a conflict that you don't think is going to last uh, much, much longer. Um, and so, again, the decision was made, hey, this is easier, uh, we, we think it will work. Um, afterwards, that was one of the reforms that they implemented, was we need to go back to unit rotations. Um, but I would say in, in 
in some, Vietnam is unique in that way. Now you can still find units that went over together and come, came back together. Interestingly enough, the unit that committed the My Lai massacre had actually trained together and deployed as a, as a unit. Um, so you can find some unit rotations. Um, yeah, yeah, unit cohesion and morale. I mean, we, the military has since determined that unit cohesion and morale is best served when you deploy as a unit. You do workups. Uh, I mean, when I was, it was six months, six months of working together, a year-long deployment, and then two months spent together on the backside, again, reintegrating or readjusting. Um, so yeah, Vietnam is in some ways unique because of the individual rotation policy. The revolution was a little bit more individual as well because it was really up to the states initially how people signed up. And so you could have militia enlistments that were 90 days, which you can't get a whole lot of training done in 90 days, and you certainly can't get a whole lot of service done. So it wasn't into until a couple of years into the war that they finally had three-year enlistments and then until the end of the war enlistments. And it's a really, even then, <coughs> depended on the state and how they decided to organize the um, regiments and the different units. And some states did do unit rotations and some didn't, some did individuals. So it's a very different type of army organization at that point. But, but then also this idea that, uh, that people weren't welcomed home, I think that individual rotation policy played into that. What I found was throughout the war, different communities would have parades and, and dances and, and these welcome home things for veterans, but since most of your veterans came home as individuals, they personally did not experience much of a, much of a welcome. And maybe it's two, three years later that you know, New York City has its parade. Well, it, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't the experience that they, that they were expecting. Can I just add something real quick to that too? In the Civil War, of course, that sense of identity is so crucial in the regiment. Um, and that is something that I've been writing about and, and, and really trying to sort of spread the word that we really need to appreciate the experience, the identity of, of you know, from this perspective of regiment and, and reassess the whole regimental history. That's been sort of dismissed, frankly, by a lot of academic historians, um, that that's, that's sort of trivia. But this is how these men conceived of themselves. And it's really important to who they first go to war with, you know, in many cases. Um, but I think that that, again, there is a qualification when you look at um, you know, African Americans, potentially other, other groups, of course, drafted men, um, substitutes. They have a very different sense of identity with the regiment. And I think it speaks to that notion of sort of indiv individualism that, that's played up in a stronger sense when you know, the reasons why they're in uniform are not the same as you know, those first wave of volunteers. Um, can I get one up front here and then I'll back there? Uh, yes, a specific question for uh, Professor Gordon. You said that the African-American soldier, uh, John Peck, was that his name, was uh, present at Petersburg. And was he there for the Battle of the Crater? And if so, did he comment on it? Or even if he was not there, did he comment on, on especially Grant's decision not to use African-American troops in that? Yeah, the 8th USCT was not at the Battle of the Crater, which you, you may well know was a, basically a slaughter of African-American troops. Um, unfortunately, the only direct words I have from him, and this is so common from black troops at the time, are from the pension records. I mean, that's a positive in the sense we can get something, but it's filtered through a white uh, a bureau you know, uh, employee or a doctor. Um, and I found even in the pension records that exist, there's some uh, conflict, there's some uh, inaccuracies in how he does, he, he gives two different uh, affidavits talking about his wounds and he mixes up, at first he says, you know, a lusty, he had a saber wound and then he says, no, that happened at Petersburg. Um, we don't know, right? We don't know if he was sincerely confused or if the white, you know, pension bureau uh, employee just wasn't paying close attention, so no, he wa he wasn't particularly at that you know, that fight. And the and the eighth USCT, uh, they are at Appomattox, so they witness the literal you know so the the surrender of 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 Lee. Uh, we don't really know how they felt. There's a recent uh, uh, blog post that I talked about earlier today by Patrick Schroeder, who works for the National Park Service, and he highlights Peck. Uh, 
And he says at the end of this piece that he assumes that Peck, even though he didn't get his disability pension, that he must have felt some satisfaction from witnessing the surrender of Lee. We don't know that. We have no idea how he felt, right? So I think we have to be really careful about pushing and making assumptions about how these men were feeling or not feeling at, at that time. Got a couple up front. Something real quick that you just mentioned that I wanted a little feedback on was the impact of the draft. You know, we've had it serially at times and now we don't have it. And the attitude of the men coming back and the people welcoming them, if you have a draft model as opposed to the enlistment model uh, of the first war. So. Uh, as it relates to Vietnam, one of the things that, that I think is uh, the fact that there was a draft uh, fueled a lot of the anti-war uh, resistance. Uh, I, I don't think Americans would have cared as much about the war had there not been a, been a draft. And I, that, that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not the... Uh... A uh, couple of points about that. The genius of the all-volunteer force is that it aligns the people most willing to run these risks with the risks. Um, and so you don't have the problems of people who don't want to be there and motivating them or supervising them. Also, another big problem about the draft systems in the US and elsewhere that are universal are a lot easier than drafts that, like in the Civil War, you could buy a substitute. That fuels a lot of resentment uh, because, of course, there's a class component to that. And you see that very um, strongly uh, exhibited in the draft during Vietnam. Yeah, I just would add to that the draft on both sides, the, both the Confederacy and the Union uh, instituted a draft and they were wildly unpopular. I don't think that that seeped into the popular narrative of the Civil War. So there were a number of soldiers that were forced into service, frankly. Um, they may, may not have been draft, but they felt this tremendous pressure to serve nonetheless. And somebody like John Peck, that unit, the 8th USCT, was, was primarily made up of drafted black men. Um, and I think that's important that we recognize that. Now, again, do we know really why an individual you know, enlisted? We don't, but in this, it could have been uh, economic. It, it could have been an opportunity. You know, there's been a lot of interesting scholarship on, on the uh, connection between um, not just citizenship, but manhood for these African-American uh, men to, to prove themselves. But if they're facing a draft, uh, yeah, there's that. Again, it's, 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 not, it's not choice. And, and that, again, is something to recognize and appreciate about this experience. And I would also say that a, a lot of the veterans that I talked to said that they actually liked the idea of a draft. However, it needs to be fair. If you're going to have it, it must be, it must be fair. Go um, ahead. I'm going to follow up on the draft. One, the question would be um, for each of you, would you reinstitute the draft as it was during, you know, during the Vietnam War? That's when it went out. And the draft, one of the, you mentioned the, one of the good things about not a draft, but the draft, one, it will bring uh, the civilian and military closer together, and the draft helped focus the attention on the Vietnam War. Right now, there's no draft. We don't know there's a war. As you said, uh, the country's at peace, military's at war. And if we had people in the draft, I mean, we would be more aware of these things that are going on, and uh, the draft, it does two things. One, it brings people's attention, and two, if for the youth to go in, and I was one of, one of the ones, I, had, I was in the first lottery, it is a very maturing experience for them, and it will, it makes them grow up, basically. And it's, so there are pros and cons on this draft, but the question overall, would you reinstitute the draft? I would not reinstitute the draft for three reasons. First, because um, we don't need a manpower pool of the enormous size that a universal draft of 18-year-olds would produce. And so you either have to have a much wider program of national service, which, which might be a great idea. Put them in the park service, fill potholes. <laughs> But that's different from a military draft. So first you have the quantity problem. If it is going to be universal, it's going to be 
probably 15 times as many people as you want in military service. Second, uh, there's a very real problem uh, that you can read a lot about in Civil War literature and in uh, World War II literature about people who don't want to be there. Um, and uh, the nature of modern warfare uh, is such that we rely very heavily on the judgment of individuals in the process. And a bad choice by a young Lance Corporal uh, shooting a civilian in Afghanistan has big consequences. And people who don't want to be there tend not to be people who are really careful about not making those kinds of mistakes. And the third reason I don't favor a draft uh, is because our military ardently, passionately doesn't want one. Um, and I think those of us who are civilians ought to have a pretty wide deference that we give the military about things of their professional competence that are not my professional competence. I would just say I'm a big fan of the idea of national service. I just have not seen a proposal that was actually workable. Um, so I wouldn't even know how you would do it. And in the Vietnam, as it was implemented during Vietnam, I know a, a lot of times the phrase, hey, this was a working class war, this was a poor man's war. Um, the way it was implemented in Vietnam, I certainly would not implement it in that manner with all the different student deferments and medical deferments that were usually taken advantage of by you know, middle class and above uh, folks. Uh, let me ask one question for, I'll go right here. I, Lindsay, you mentioned that there was a really strong correlation between service and then support for federal power after service. Um, how does that work out in these other wars? I mean, the Civil War is a pretty strong uh, example of how that might bifurcate. But I wonder how you see that and veterans coming back, what's their relationship to how they feel about the national government versus state government, if you have any thoughts on that? Vietnam veterans were not. <laughs> uh, they, 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 many, many expressed, you know, they, they were disillusioned. Uh, they felt that they had been lied to we, with the Pentagon Papers. A number of my subjects talked about the Pentagon Papers and realizing that had senior officials had been saying one thing and, and doing another. A lot of animosity towards senior military leaders like General Westmoreland, who they felt you know, they'd been ill-served by. So I would say there's a, a, a decrease in folks' faith in the federal government uh, as a result of Vietnam. Well, I would just say that in you know in the part of the Union veterans, you know there's a there's at least a whole right generation of these men, including U.S. Grant, who who go into um, uh, politics and serve, and they're and they're in state government, they're in their federal government, and of course the entire pension service, uh, pension bureau, which is really created and, and extended and becomes a huge part of the federal budget and a controversial part as we move to the turn of the century. Um, there starts to be pushback by uh, you know, later generations of Americans who feel that, that these uh, veterans are taking advantage, that they've, they've become dependent. You, know, you hear the, the kind of terms that maybe we, some people I think assume is a, a modern debate. It was happening at the turn of the century in dealing with uh, Union veterans now in the in the South, you know, every I'm pretty sure that every Confederate former Confederate state created eventually a pension, uh, a state pension. But I always think it's interesting. I say to my students, you know, when you look at the Civil War experience, particularly from the Confederate experience, the Confederates they start introducing social programs that look a lot like the New Deal. We're taking care of you know, veterans, uh, but also you know, extending uh, support and help to orphans and widows, um, the, the kind of things that start to, to be talked about in the, in the New Deal, and they only expand and explode, really, in the aftermath of World War II. That didn't come out of nowhere. That starts, the discussion really starts, and of course, some of it goes all the way back. Well, I just want to make one really important distinction about the service after the revolution, which is that it was heavily officer-based. So. Um, the Continental Army lost more battles than it won. Um, that's always a fun statistic when we think of General Washington. He lost more battles than he won. But because the officers were the ones that were going into government positions, and they were the ones that maybe had been making decisions, there was less criticism of things like we saw during the Vietnam War. I mean, and also, the Continental Army won the war, 
So um, it's easier to avoid that criticism in that way. So I just wanted to draw those two important distinctions. For contemporary veterans, they have the spread of attitudes about the government that um, the rest of society has. They, it, it is often thought that the American military, in particular the officer corps, is more conservative than the rest of the population, and that's actually not true. The attitudes of folks in the military, enlisted, non-commissioned officers, and officers correlate almost exactly with those with the attitudes of civilians of equal education level and equal income that those are the two strong correlates that carry um, so so uh, but a second point which uh, not many people realize is that because we have for over 40 years had preferential veterans hiring practices in the federal government, there are over 250,000 veterans who are federal government employees. So a disproportionately large part of our federal workforce of the bureaucrats uh, who make the government run, of people who are TSA security at airports, those people are veterans. Go right here. I have a personal observation and a question for all the panelists. Uh, growing up in a household with a father who was a Korean conflict veteran, uh, and then I was a young man during the Vietnam era and worked with Vietnam vets in my early career. Now in my career, we very proudly in my organization hire veterans to work from Gulf War, uh, those kind of things. What I have found personally is where it's family or coworkers, they don't really want to talk about it, is my personal observation. So when you're doing research, do you find and do you find that they don't want to talk about it, they do want to talk about it, or if they don't, what are the reasons why they don't want to share? Yeah, um, it's a really good question, and I don't think you can generalize that uh, about the attitudes of veterans writ large. And one of the challenges for us as researchers is not to extrapolate from personal anecdote. That is, the plural of anecdote isn't data. Um, and yet, it's really hard to resist that temptation. Um, and, and so I, I have had the experience of a lot of contemporary veterans not wanting to talk about it, either because they think you won't understand this is a big problem across the civil military gap. Um, many times civilians don't have the vocabulary or the understanding of the kind of practices and sensitivities of the military, so they don't know how to ask, right? They don't know how, instead of saying thank you for your service, saying, what made you choose to join the Air Force? Right, something that invites them into telling their experience on terms they're comfortable with. A third reason they often don't want to talk about it is that they're still processing it themselves. They don't, they don't have an answer to your question um, or, or an answer that makes them comfortable in this conversation. One of the things both Nate and I found is that with such, with such a gap between civilians and the military, and the smaller size of the force in the post-Vietnam forces, um, that veterans' literature is actually a fabulous way to, because veterans don't just write about their own experience, they, they generalize and give many different perspectives. So a couple of fabulous writers that I would commend to your uh, reading, Phil Cly, who wrote the National Book Award uh, winning set of short stories called Redeployment. It's fabulous, 10 stories that tell 10 different veterans' experiences and are a real window into it. Uh, Elliot Ackerman, who's written several novels about the veteran experience. My favorite is one called Green on Blue, which is about, uh, it's about an, an insider attack on American forces in Afghanistan told from the perspective of the assailant. Um, let's see, what else? Terminal Lance, there's a very funny Marine uh, comic strip called Terminal Lance, uh, meaning you're a Lance Corporal and you're never getting promoted because of your behavior. Um, and the, the Marine vet who writes that comic strip wrote a really powerful graphic novel called The White Donkey about the experience of Marines in Iraq. Uh, 
And all three of those are a great way to learn about the experience of contemporary veterans without, it, without having veterans be able to open up to you or to any of us in that way. So I would just say, as a, a Marine and a veteran, I, I haven't had a problem getting veterans to, to open up. What my problem usually is, is the more you listen to these stories, a lot of times veterans will misremember things, especially when you're talking with Vietnam veterans where this experience may have been 50 years in the past. You actually start to see things from film, things from books start to work their way into people's memories of, of these events. And it's not that they're lying, this is what they remember, it's just that their memory of these events aren't accurate. So I have some issues searching, you know, sorting through some of that. Um, so not so much getting them to talk, but trying to actually find out what really happened. Uh, is, is harder and, and one of the things I've actually encouraged, so most of my students are military officers, I actually encourage them to actually reach out more, you know, go tell your story to anyone uh, who will listen, don't, don't shut yourself off, um, because that whole idea that, oh, well, if oh, no one could understand, like, I think that's kind of a cop-out if you know, there's all sorts of experiences and the only way we can try to understand each other is by sharing some of this of these stories, uh, and so I, I encourage them to, to reach out as, uh, as well. But especially the way, you, the way you heard Corey ask it, which is, oh, tell me about why you joined the Air Force. I mean, that's a great, a great way to start. Uh, yeah, so Civil War, story, uh, Civil War soldiers left us a lot of material, right? We're, we're really, there was like an explosion, and men that were barely literate uh, were writing home and keeping diaries, and then after the war wrote, one of the things that has been really interesting to me, and in my last book I track this, is that those, their accounts and their memories change. They're not static. I, and again, I don't think we paid enough, pay, have paid enough attention to that. But your question to you about men, veterans that don't want to talk about it, yes, there is that too. Um, it's, again, I think there, there's these consistencies and these experiences that need to be, to me, recognized. In, you know, in the Civil War and the post-war era, there was a lot of fighting going on among some of these, you know, former generals about what actually happened. And there's publications, the National Tribune, the Southern Society, historical papers. Um, and so they're having it out. Uh, but if you go in and read these and contrast it to the wartime accounts, you know, there's a, there's a lot of tension. I welcome that tension. I think that's really fascinating and interesting for us to explore as historians. Um, there has been, you know, some folks, uh, if you know Carol Reardon's book, which is a great book about Pickett's Charge, she essentially says at one point, well, we can never know. Well, no, we can know a lot. We can know a lot just, again, from the contrast, from the contradictions, from the gaps. That teaches us, I think, a lot about the experience and about these men really, literally grappling with what actually happened. So one of the delightful challenges, um, but obstacles about writing about the revolution is that there just isn't that much that survives from the 1770s and the 1780s. Because it wasn't until the 1820s that people really started to think, oh wow, this, you know, this generation is dying off and it was the first greatest generation, and maybe we need to start preserving some of these things. We need to start preserving the letters. We need to start having you know, a very rudimentary version of oral history. But I can't go talk to them. I love to ask some questions, but I can't. Um, and so what we know is when someone was willing to talk about it, um, especially because in the enlisted forces, it was, by and large, really poor men or it was enslaved people who were fighting to win their freedom, or it was um, someone, yeah, and, and, and so Americans did have really high literacy compared to other nations at the time, but our literacy compared to now was nothing, it, it was nothing. And so there just weren't that many people that were writing letters. However, the letters we do have um, they were dying to talk about their experience because they felt like the states weren't supporting them. And so they were saying, you don't understand, we don't have shoes, so can you please send some shoes? Or you don't understand, the, the meat that you sent to us was rotten, we can't eat it. Can you please send food that is better quality? Um, and when, so we see these letters over and over and over again because they felt that that was the only way that they could get people to support their cause. The mic's right back here. Yeah. And I'm, Thank you for your work, guys. Um, now, I'm not sure if this is a, if there's a compiled focus on why you all wrote what you wrote, 
But I think it would really be helpful if you told the American public that the United States military is not invincible. Now, I know that Marine doesn't want to hear that. I, I know that. He's, just relax, sir. Relax. But we can't do anything anytime and win all the time everywhere. It just, it's just not feasible to do that. And as military officers, we buy into that, too. When Donald Rumsfeld said that, well, we go to war with the army we got, I was astounded. Um, but he really believed that. And he proved that he, he proved himself wrong. It takes a tremendous amount of energy and, and money and training to get ready and stay ready. And if we're not willing to pay the tax burden for that, and we're not willing to give our own sons and daughters for that, well, in the last couple of years, we flippantly said, well, we'll just go to war. Well, we're going to go to war in South America now. We'll just, well, we'll just go to war. We'll just go beat them. That is so irresponsible and deadly. So if there is one compiled focus for you guys, I hope it would be to let folks know that these are human beings. They catch bullets. They die. We die. We're a very small part of the population. Everybody, I, know, I mean, one thing about, one great thing about being a military family is I got a whole lot of brothers, and I don't suffer the same things I do in a regular population that I did, I mean, that I, when in the military, we're all brothers. And that and was I, awesome. Now, just, just to make the point of getting ready and staying ready and being ready, I'm driving down Mockingbird the other day, and the SMU football team is getting ready. So football season isn't for five or six months. We don't even think about how much it takes to get, to get ready to go to war. But we just throw that out there like it's something that we can do easily and win. We buy into it, and unfortunately, because we're so separated, like one of the panelists said, it's easy for you to believe because you don't have to go. Not you in the room, but you writ large America. You don't have to go. And unfortunately, with that comment about the leaders, the non-military draft dodgers, really, who won over non-draft dodgers, that says a whole lot. That should be a disqualifier. Bad feet, bad what It should be a disqualifier to be the leader of the commander in chief of the military. But that's just me, because I've been there. And so I, one of the things that I do talk about and that I think is unfortunate about the fact that the Vietnam generation of leaders is, is kind of, has, has kind of moved on is that I do think that in general, those who attained high office tended to be more skeptical about the use of force, more careful, more deliberate. Um, and I do, I think that's, that's a, a legacy of, of their generation. Even if you go back to the first Gulf War, it was a very you know, popular war for the most part, but it was veterans in Congress who actually pressed the White House, hey, you, you really need to think about these things and this and that, uh, and who actually voted against the war because they weren't satisfied with some of the answers they were getting. Uh, and so I talk about it a, a little bit, and I think it, it is, it's, it's unfortunate that, that that generation is, is is, is no longer and, can I, and sir, can I just add to you, you know, as a historian of the 19th century, I think what also, frankly, our culture is sort of embedded, sort of baked in there, I still think there's an assumption that there's the citizen soldier, right, that can jump up and fight and be a superhero, doesn't need training, doesn't, I still think that's in our, you know, floating about, and that's been fought against and fought against going back to the revolution through, through every era of that really, it doesn't work that way. You know, once you're in a war, it's really hard to get out of a war. Um, and the implications can be quite complicated and long lasting. And I, as a historian, I feel that that's really important to talk about publicly, you know. And Colin Powell and H.W. Bush understood that because they were warriors, great people fought it, and the folks who are put up there now were never in the combat. All I would, I would uh, say two things. First, to reinforce your point that there have been 50,000 Purple Hearts issued since the year 2000. 50,000. Um, and the second point is, though, that civil military relations in the United States are an unequal playing field in which we as voters can elect any idiot we want, however unqualified she or he is. <laughs> Okay, I want to take, well, I know that we've got lots of questions, but I want to respect everyone's time. We have one last question here. It's had her hand up, or had a hand up for a long time. Uh, Lindsay, you had mentioned about the, uh, in the Revolutionary War, and the soldiers were uh, disliked, they weren't trusted. Was, was that part post-war, post 
why there was a prohibition established against the seizure or the, or of, of civilian housing by the military and other constant and, and post that has there been other laws regulations effect, uh, coming out of other wars between the civilian and the military cultures so that prohibition actually dates back to the 1760s and it was very much a reaction against the british government so after Great Britain had a huge victory over France in the Seven Years' War. They decided to station a large number of regular officers and troops in the 13 colonies. And in order to station them, they needed to have some place for them to live. And so they passed a law, it was called the Quartering Act, that troops could be placed in civilian housing. And they re-upped it again in the 1770s. And it was wildly unpopular for all of the reasons you can imagine. <laughs> People don't really want soldiers living in their homes if they don't know them. And um, so one of, it was, it was part of a lead up to the revolution and it was, it was very much a part of the um, embedded nature, the ideology of the revolution and of independence because um, there had been a, a pushback against a standing army in Great Britain. Britons didn't like a standing army either. It's why they had a really big navy and a really small army and it's why they put some of their army officers in the colonies because the British didn't then have to see them. And so we very much inherited that ideology and that was deeply embedded in sort of the American psyche. And so um, that was, it, it, it just, that it, it was, that prohibition was re-upped because this distrust of the standing army was a fabric of who, of who we were. And I would argue to a certain extent, it's still a fabric of who we are because we, have we put soldiers on these bases because it's easier sometimes for Americans not to see them. It's unfortunate that our World War II, our, that the historian who covered World War I and World War II couldn't be here because one of the interesting things, we think about the GI Bill today as this wonderful thing where the country is rewarding its veterans, but I would argue if you look at the discussions surrounding the GI Bill, it was partly out of fear because the, the people that put that together, they remembered the World War I veterans marching on Washington as part of the bonus march during the Great Depression, demanding their benefits. And so this idea is veterans as potentially dangerous. How do we contain this? You know, part of that is why we have a GI, you know, why we had the GI Bill after World War II. It wasn't all, this, you know, it wasn't all just a, a just reward. Um, the fact that we have so many standing questions is just a testament to how much we appreciate you all, your interest, your curiosity. Um, I want to thank you for being here this year, and let's thank together our panelists for this evening. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, have a great summer. We welcome you back in September.